I will be leaving the board after today, and one of my last and most pleasant duties is to chair uh, our final awards session for this meeting. Um, we'll, have, we'll have two, actually, um, in, in sequence. Uh, the first is our Orsted Medal presentation, and that will be followed by the Homer L. Dodge Distinguished Service Citations. This year's Orsted Medal goes to Dean Zolman. I'll ask Dean to come up. The Ersted Medal for 2014 is presented to Dean Zolman in recognition of his significant contributions to physics education research and to mentoring of a generation of PER researchers. Zolman earned his BS and MS in physics from Indiana University Bloomington. His PhD in theoretical nuclear physics was earned at the University of Maryland College Park. He started his career as assistant professor at Kansas State University in 1970, becoming associate professor, professor, distinguished university teaching scholar, university distinguished professor, and head of the Department of Physics, and William and Joan Porter professor from 2001 to 2011. Zolman has achieved some of the milestones considered indicative of an intellectual giant in the physics education field rising up from the academic ladder to, to spend over 30 years as a full professor authoring an extensive record of research publications with dozens of co-authors, securing an impressive record of consistent extramural funding for over three decades, and mentoring a long list of students and postdocs who have, grown, who have gone on to establish themselves in the field. His contributions to physics are threefold a dedicated pursuit of the application of advanced technologies to bring the beauty of physics to all learners, an unwavering commitment to mentoring his protégés, <laughs> his, his protégés long after, uh, uh, after they had, had left school and find their way in the world, and continuing physics education research and the impact of that research on the teaching and learning of physics. He has served APT as, as served as APT staff physicist from 1975 to 1977, and was instrumental in the development of the APT workshop program, which has become an important fixture of the association's summer and winter meetings. In 1981, 82, Zolman was the visiting associate professor and NSF faculty fellow at the University of Utah. He has been a great professor, a, a guest professor in Germany, at uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich in 1989 and 2006, and at the Institute for Science Education, IPN in Kiel, in 1998 and 2007. Solman was recognized for his service to AAPT with a 1986 Distinguished Service Citation for his implementation of the workshop as an interface between knowledge and execution, he has directed workshops and served as a member of the Physics Teacher Editorial Board, served in the Computers and Physics Education Committee, and on various task force. In 1985, AAPT recognized him with, as a teacher who has made notable and creative contributions to the teaching of physics and awarded him the Millikan Medal. So with, we're finally rounding out with or awarding the Ersted today, and all, not, last but not least, I have to mention that Dean is a dedicated Run Walk supporter. So, <laughs> my congratulations. All right, I think they're going to want you on this side for the picture. The Ersted receives a, a plaque and also the medal, as well as a check. See if I can do this without dropping the medal this time. There we go. I'll let you know. No, okay. I can drop it, right? <laughs> Thank you. And now Dean will present the lecture that accompanies the Ersted Medal. Thank you. Uh, what Jill didn't mention was that uh, she could have said it in the run yesterday. I was the fastest person in my age group. Yeah. 
<laughs> I was also the slowest person, but that's okay. Okay. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about some of our work and, and some other people's work on trying to increase the amount of learned physics that comes into various courses. I'll focus somewhat on introductory courses because that's what I know best, but I'll talk about others as well. And I thought a little bit about whether I should uh, use the, the term modern physics uh, because, as we all know, it has a very broad meaning in, uh, in our community. I thought about saying something like teaching a postmodern modern physics course, <laughs> or a modern postmodern, you know, or, or put post both places. But then in, in talking to my son, who is a philosopher, uh, he tells me that philosophy uses modern philosophy for everything that goes back to something like the 17th century or 18th century. And that with, for my daughter, I've been doing uh, some little posts on her, her blog for historical novelists uh, on some history things in physics. And I find the historians of physics or historians of science say modern for anything that comes after Galileo. So <laughs> I decided I'd just do this. OK, and of course, when something like this happens, it's first humbling in a way, and of course, it really feels good. But it also caused me to do quite a bit of reflection on you know, what's, what was all of this. Uh, Jill mentioned I started at Kansas State in 1970. I was actually for the first two years on a temporary appointment. And I can really set rather well when the, uh, the idea that I might be doing things in physics education started. And it actually started on uh, a trip that Jackie and I, Jackie Spears and I made, that we went from Manhattan to Colorado Springs. Uh, in those days, the speed limit wasn't very high. Uh, it took us a long time. At that time, I was still in the temporary appointment. And we ended up talking about physics teaching almost all the way. Uh, now, I had probably said everything that I really knew about physics teaching at that time by the time we got to Salina. <laughs> but. Jackie was uh, gentle and kept telling me I was wrong, but you know, in a kind way. She had been a high school teacher. She knew a lot more than I did about this stuff. And what that did was it gave me the courage to apply for a job that Kansas State had. And that job was a job in, uh, yeah, that's what I looked like a little bit later. I couldn't find a 1970s picture, and that's probably good. Uh, <laughs> but Kansas State was advertising for somebody to do, quote, scholarly work in physics education. Uh, and so I applied for it. I was unqualified, but that didn't matter. There weren't any real physics education people out there. Uh, today, my students would certainly beat me out for such a job. But I got appointed, and I got offered a position, tenure track assistant professor, uh, to conduct scholarly activities related to teaching. Those, those are not the exact words. I cannot find my appointment paper. I'm not quite that obsessive. Uh, but, but I started at that time. Uh, and the job actually started in June of 1972. Uh, during that summer, I went to a workshop. I met Bob Fuller. Uh, that started a uh, collaboration that continued up for 40 years. So, so that's kind of where it started. Now, I don't plan to give you my life story here. Actually, Jill's done a better job than I could anyway. Um, but today, we have a quite different group than me and maybe a graduate student. And uh, I'm rather proud of the fact that, as far as I know, we're the only group that got onto the cover of physics today. And that was about halfway between then and now. And that's Kevin, our son. Uh, 
he's a little older now, uh, <laughs> and sitting down here in the second row. Uh, and our group today looks somewhat like this. Uh, we have three faculty members back here, one visiting faculty, a bunch of graduate students, two postdocs, one graduate student and one postdoc were not available for the picture. But it's a pretty big group and a, obviously a, a pretty active group as well. Okay, so that gets that started. Uh, there's been a lot of talk and of course some effort to endow the uh, Melba's Philba, Phillips uh, Medal. And I think this quote from her Orsted talk is a pretty nice one in what all of us are trying to do, whether we happen to be physics education researchers or we're just trying to teach well. We're trying to be sensitive to what the students are saying, understand why they might be saying what they are, even when it doesn't quite seem to fit what we want them to say, and then trying to reach them to uh, make things a little different and make them enjoy physics as well. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is four parts, I hope, although there is going to be some audience interaction, so when that happens, you're never quite sure about the timing. I'm going to start out with some physics education research, just a few thoughts about that. Talk about topics in modern physics, and then if we have time, some things about the delivery methods, and then end up with uh, <laughs> the questions I can't answer, uh, which will be out there. Now to do this, I'm going to have questions for you. And we're going to allow you to use any uh, mobile device. Uh, so I'm going to do something I have never done in giving a talk or a class of any kind. You can turn on your cell phones. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but put them in silent mode, please. OK. There's no wireless network in the room. So we're going to use a system that allows you to respond with a smartphone and with a web browser on a smartphone if you have that through your data service or by sending text messages. However, I must warn you, you're paying for it. OK. <laughs> we, we're not paying for it. Many of you I know, particularly the younger people in the audience, have unlimited text, unlimited data, so it doesn't matter. Now, originally this was going to be streamed, and now it's not being streamed. So I was really going to try to try an experiment here and see how many people would stream in an answer. But unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that. But we'll get to this in just a second. Uh, start with physics education research. Uh, again, a quote from an Orsted medalist. Uh, 1961, Francis Sears advocated that research in teaching is as important as research in physics. Took a long time after that before I think we could say that really has come about at least in some of the physics departments in the country. OK, so here is your first question. Um, and this is a multiple choice question. The, uh, I got some, oops, there we go. Uh, I've got some choices here to try to put yourself on a spectrum about uh, physics education research. In order to do use this system, you can text to this number and use whatever code you've got down here. Or in just a second, you will be able to go to uh, that web address and just select one. That's obviously the easier way to do it and you will have one minute to uh, enter an answer. So please go ahead. I've gotten one in already, OK.
Okay, well, this audience seems to be almost evenly split between the top two categories. We had 24 for this one, 27 for the next one, seven for the third one, one here, and one down there. Oh. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, we'll, we'll go on anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, there was about a uh, one or two second difference between the time I started the survey and I clicked the button there. Sorry about that. Okay, you'll, have t you'll get another chance in a few minutes. Okay, so as I kind of expected, this audience is fairly sympathetic to, to PER, and I don't need to do my usual uh, missionary uh, speech here. Uh, so, and that's probably good for, you, for those of you who are in the system anyway. So that, that'll, that worked pretty well. The next one's gonna be an open-ended question in a few minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but let me just mention a few things about where, for those of you who are in that second group, who are users and readers of PR, where you can get some information that's relatively recent. One is this National Research Council report uh, called Adapting to a Changing World. Uh, there was a group, including myself, who spent a long time uh, banging on this thing and getting it out. Uh, I just picked out one quote. It is not a PER report per se. It is a report on undergraduate physics education, which happens to include a lot of PER stuff. Uh, I'm not gonna read this quote, but it's very similar to something I said to one of my colleagues uh, rather recently. And that is by itself, Physics education research will not make you a good teacher. If you apply it, it will definitely make you a better teacher. But good is different from better. So it is something that's important for us to think about. This book, by the way, has an interesting pricing structure, which the National Academies use for everything. If you buy a paper copy, it'll cost you up to 50 bucks by the time you spend for shipping and handling. If you go and download it, it's free. Okay, now PER is a little older than uh, some of us think. Uh, I found this in a footnote in Eric Rogers' uh, Orsted speech. Uh, he ran an experiment that looks very similar to an experiment some of us would run today. Okay, can students spout out Newton's second law or Newton's laws in general? Yeah, they can do it. Can they explain what they mean? No, and he's even got numbers associated with that. Um, other recent reviews that you might want to take a look at, and the first one particularly is a, not something that's publicized a lot, but Jennifer Doctor and Jose Mestra, both of whom are here, uh, did this for another committee at the National Academy a couple of years ago, and it is a very nice synthesis it is also 150 pages, so you, you need to either know you want to look at a certain part or really uh, look at it uh, in great detail. Last year, David Metzler and, Meltzer and uh, Ron Thornton, again, both of whom are here, uh, put out a resource letter on evidence-based active learning instruction. The evidence-based isn't in the title, but it's really in the, the print, the, whole idea there, and then an ongoing effort, primarily by Sam McKagan, also here. Uh, I'm saying here when I've seen the people at the meeting. They may not be in the room right now. Uh, <laughs> the Pre-ER User's Guide is uh, readily available and changing all the time and adding things to it. Uh, let me make one comment about links. I'm gonna throw several up here to let you know they exist, but uh, you don't need to write them down. These uh, slides will be posted both on the AAPT website and on our group's website, so you can go get them there rather than trying to scribble something down fast while I'm running by it. Uh, research in modern physics, I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing things that have happened, uh, but here are kind of some general topics, uh, classifications that I use. 
Uh, there are all these things on initial concepts. Uh, of course, it's a little harder. You, know, you don't necessarily have students who have initial concepts of wave functions. Difficulties in learning various topics. Uh, there, there are really a large amount of that. Some transfer from classical to modern. Uh, using resources and then assessment of student understanding. I'm going to give you one example, and this time you'll get a little bit longer to look at it. Um, in this example, I've got a picture that probably all of you have seen at some time. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask you to think about, and even talk to your neighbor if you want to about this, what is wrong with this picture? And uh, the way you do this one is pretty much the same, except if you use a text system, what you have to do is send it to that phone number, but then so that system knows that it's mine and not somebody else's, you've got to enter in the code number and then a couple of words. If you go to the website, you can just type in a couple of words. And let's see, I've got too many gadgets in my hand. We'll start that one first this time, and now I'll start this so it'll be a couple of seconds behind. Okay, so feel free to talk to each other about it and send me some words. Okay. Okay, so I've got a word cloud up here, and unfortunately, we had a little problem making this rather ancient computer uh, sync with the, the video system. And, you know, that happens. I can remember going to an Orsted talk where the overhead projector bulb burned out. So, you know, <laughs> so technology always doesn't work. But we, the biggest common word is labels. Second one is axes. Okay. okay. And then there are others like amplitude, frequency, and so forth. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and take this word cloud and paste it into the presentation that will be posted so you can see it. But indeed, those are some of the major issues. A lot of the work done on this particular idea was done at the University of Maryland. We did a little bit uh, at our uh, group as well. But yeah, what, what are the units of the vertical axis? You know, if actually, if you think about it, if a student put in a graph like this, you probably would send it back to have them redo it. Uh, energy 
The energy level seems to be the horizontal axis for the wave function. Uh, one of the things that, that was done uh, at Maryland was to have students talk about this, and they would talk about the electron needing to step up, climb up the side of the barrier, and then go across and climb back down. That takes time and so forth. And then does the wave function represent the actual motion of the particle? We've done some things on that as well. But the point here is that this kind of research is out there, and it's very useful. Uh, I was pleased to find I had to go through three modern physics books before I found this diagram. The other two, and these were all published about the same time, uh, take the wave function off of the potential energy diagram. And uh, that's really good. Now, this is not a new discovery. Uh, at an AAP teaching month uh, one time, I was talking to Ed Taylor about how we had discovered this and what neat thing it was. And he pointed out to me that he and Tony French, when they wrote their quantum physics book in 1978, had realized that this was a problem, even though they had done no research, and went ahead and put all of these things on separate graphs. But now it's certainly well founded within the research community. OK, there are quite a few research-based uh, curricula out there or lessons out there. I've thrown a few up on this screen that are primarily for non-science students, could be used in high schools as well as uh, universities. The uh, FET project, of course, has many things in addition to modern physics, but has some very nice modern physics stuff. For more advanced levels, there still are some some good pieces of work that can be used, put into various classes. I put the two at the lower, down at the bottom end, uh, not because I expect you to go off and, and speak French or German, but just to point out that this is not just uh, US-based materials that are coming out in this particular area. Finally, on thinking about quantum mechanics, uh, there are uh, some freely available concept inventories. These are ordered somewhat in order of the highest one being for the highest level student and going down to the more uh, conceptual uh, level course. Uh, the first and third are actually in the paper. The inventory itself is in the paper uh, for the second one and the fourth one for Chandra Laika's and Sam McKagan's. Uh, they will send you a password so that you can use it and you can get it off of Compadre. And in fact, when you want more information, because I'm not giving anywhere close to all of it here, uh, the quantum exchange on Compadre and the PER user's guides are great places to go. Okay. Okay, let's talk a little bit about content. And uh, here's a quote on content from Ed Taylor that, uh, you know, we ought to be exploiting the idea that, that we have quantum mechanics and relativity that really seem to interest almost everybody. Uh, now, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to answer two questions. And the first, you need to have a couple of definitions. This definition basically says, modern physics is anything that you think it is. Okay. <laughs> and introductory course is basically anything that you think it is. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is repeat a couple of questions that were on a survey that Gary White, the editor of The Physics Teacher, sent out about a month ago. And Gary has very graciously given me his results so we can compare the results of this group with the results of 400 and some odd TPT readers who responded to uh, his survey. So the first question is, what is the most essential topic in modern physics that ought to be in an introductory course? And again, this is open-ended. And uh, try this again this way. Start the timer there, and then start the timer here. And you should be able to answer that question now.
It's really kind of fun to watch these word clouds form as uh, time goes on. It keeps changing, you know. Okay. I'm hearing people talk about last night's football game. So uh, that's in my, in my class, that's usually the way I decide that we don't quite need all the time. Okay. Uh, okay, the words you've got up here, mechanics is rather large, uh, but quantum is even larger. I suspect the quantum and the mechanics came together plenty, several times. Special relativity is big. Wave uh, nuclear is, is fairly large, and quite a few people were a little bit lazy, and they just typed in QM. Okay, so, <laughs> but that's okay. I would be lazy, too. I, in fact, I, I have a hard time sending text ma messages. My fingers are too big. Okay, now, here's the harder question. Now, you're gonna, if you're going to put these things in your class, you've got to take something out, right? And you can start thinking about that. This computer's being a little slow right now. Okay. Let me... Ah, ooh, I blew it. Let's go back. We'll try that again. Okay, I... Don't have to hit it twice. Okay, so now what were what would you like to take out of the course? Okay, at the moment, the way this one was unfolding, I think that uh, what words wins depend on when the clock ran out. Uh, optics is the biggest word here. Then motion and circuits, but then there are two words that are the same size and very telling. One says nothing, the other one says everything. <laughs> So what can I do but have you think about that for the rest of your, of your lives, probably? OK, here, here are my dealings with the words that came from the TPT survey, very similar to yours. And let me go on to the next slide, because when I tried this out in my group, they said they spent all their time trying to read the really fine print. So I made one without the fine print in it. Uh, but the quantum relativity, wave particle duality, very similar to this group. Okay. Standard model is the one you probably can't read all the way over there on the left. And then photoelectric effect and quantization are down here in the middle. Notice this is a rather large group. There were about 450 teachers who responded, giving 630 different topics. OK, now, when they responded to what should they leave out? I think, you know, what, 
what topics would you leave out? None win wins by a huge amount. Okay, and then a lot of other things are about the same. It's a little bit different from here, but not all that different. Probably the most telling feature of this, and, and uh, worth trying to figure out, although probably would be nice to go back and ask a couple more questions, which is true in every survey type thing I've ever done, only 40 people responded to this one. So only 10% of the people who responded to the first one felt that they even wanted to say something about this. I guess they, they felt uh, like it was too hard to deal with. OK. OK, so let's talk a, a little bit about uh, this. Now, first, let me mention that those who felt that you can't leave out anything from classical physics are in good company. In 1948, Arnold Sommerfeld uh, said basically the same thing. You can't curtail anything because all of it is important. Uh, Arnold Ahrens, however, had a different viewpoint on it, and he's not talking so much about what concepts can you teach or not teach, but that what we need to do is teach people how we know and what we know, and if you do that, lots of students can understand why we believe that the atom is structured the way it is, why we think that uh, electrons going through a double slit behave like waves and so forth. And that's certainly a point of view that we have taken with the Visual Quantum Mechanics Project and uh, is one that, that we've tried to do a lot. We've tried to do a lot of visualizations. We've tried to use some uh, real hands-on experiments and so forth so that students can understand not just what physicists say is happening, but why physicists think that this is what is happening. Uh, just a quick, a quick example of some model building that we do. Uh, we have students look at the spectrum, a real one, not the one I've got up here, uh, and then they learn about the fact that only certain energies are coming out, so therefore there are only certain energy levels, and then they try to build some models. And here are three models that came off of uh, various students' uh, computers. And we talk about which one's right and which one's wrong. Well, based only on that observation, it's very difficult to distinguish between these. So then we go on to the infrared and ultraviolet, and that does make it a little easier. But at this point, we try to argue, or not argue, we try to emphasize that, in fact, things aren't always that easy to sort out, that any one of these three models could be correct to explain just this one observation. But you get other observations, you get more detail. And I'm going to run out of time, so I need to go a little bit faster. Actually, I'm not going to go faster. I'm going to skip some stuff. Uh, we take that, and then we are able to build a spectrum of or a energy level model for an LED. First, it looks a little bit like that, where we try to use the single energy levels to build band, bands of energy or bands of light coming out. And then we switch to, to a different visualization and let the students manipulate these bands and gaps and see if they can build different uh, LED spectra from all of that. All observation, all empirical, no great details, but an opportunity for students to see how it is from just a little bit of information, the light coming out of a light source, you can build something that tells you about the atoms inside it. Uh, and what we try to do overall is help students understand that they can indeed understand and understand how we learn about these objects. Now, we haven't quite gotten to the point that Sheldon is there, where he's trying to explain to Penny I think the decay of the top quark, uh, and at least that's what the Feynman diagram in the upper left looks like, and the rest of it I don't understand either. So, <laughs> but building these conceptual models is important. On the other hand, what are you going to do about inclined planes? Now, a couple of years ago, I would say, who needs the inclined plane? Everybody knows that you, won't, you put a ramp on the back of your U-Haul truck to get things up there, and that's all they need to know. But today, people are getting more sophisticated. And 
So Leonard here is saying, what would you be if you were attached to another object by an inclined plane wrapped around, wrapped helically around an axis? Okay. Now I am amazed that this joke can appear on broadcast television. And when I went looking for it, I discovered I could buy T-shirts, coffee mugs, umbrellas, you know, all of them got this thing on it, okay? So maybe we do need to teach inclined planes, okay? <laughs> and for those of you who are aficionados of the Big Bang Theory, I know this is the wrong picture to go with that, uh, that joke, but the right one, the only one I could find was a really bad YouTube video, okay? Now, I'm out, I am getting out of time, and this is the one place where, not having control of everything up here, could you guys go down and click on the little arrow in the, cor the right-hand corner? That'll, yeah, great. Just click on it. It does nothing? There we go, good. So I I'm, I'm spent too much time on other things, so I'll, I'll just tell you very, very briefly that we are thinking about how we can deliver all of this, including the hands-on activities, to um, an online audience. We are not thinking about MOOCs yet. Uh, there are a lot of issues with MOOCs, many of which have been brought up at various times in this meeting. If you're interested in a quick summary, uh, NPR on, I think, New Year's Eve did, on All Things Considered, did about a three-minute uh, discussion of MOOCs and where they are and what some of the concerns are. But in any case, being able to deliver this to an audience that's not sitting in front of you is something that we are looking at now, and numbers of other people are as well. And so with that, I won't say anything more about that, uh, but I'll leave you with some things to think about. Uh, the, we really need a lot more research, a lot more physics education research on learning at this level. I think the whole issue of how you transfer what you learn about wave motion uh, and many other things to wave functions and, and so forth, is, there's been some good work, but there needs to be more. And from my point of view, I always like to, to word things in the way that I have it on the second uh, sub-bullet there. You know, people say, well, we need to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And that's related to the way medical research is done. Except when you really look at the medical research, you know, the pills that work, work for about 30% of the sample. You know, a, a pill is a success if it works for a very small fraction of the people that take it uh, in the trials, okay? Um, so we need to look at what works, well, how it works for different groups, and how it works under different circumstances. And of course, that fragments everything. But I think it's important for us to do that if we are going to uh, continue to make progress on teaching these kinds of things, or probably any kinds of things. Uh, this whole uh, issue of what do you leave out, I think could be better looked at is how do you rearrange the topics? Jackie and I wrote a textbook 20-some uh, years ago where chapter four was special relativity. Everybody told us it wouldn't work, except the people who tried it. And this was for a, a non-science audience. Uh, and then, of course, we do have to look at how these new delivery methods are going to impact both the pedagogy and the content. And, and that's uh, going to be an ongoing thing for many years to come. And uh, <laughs> I put down the bottom, we'll ever really address all these issues. We will certainly keep working at them. And there's not going to be, there's no right answer to any of these things, so we'll just keep going. Okay, let me conclude with one more comment from uh, an Orsted medalist, Lynn Jossum, who, who said that recognizing the need for change is easier than deciding what to do, and I think that's some of what I've tried to show in, in my talk today, that yeah, a lot of us can agree there, there is a need for change. How exactly we do that is something that we still have to work on and still have to do a lot more on. So, I thank you. Uh, I will post the talk slides with all the links at the second web address. The top web address is our groups. And uh, 
the, uh, the, my email's up there as well if anybody wants to talk to me further about this. I have two quotes from Orsted to stop. All the other quotes were from Orsted lectures. Orsted, unfortunately, never got the Orsted medal. Uh, <laughs> but the first one points out that uh, lectures aren't everything. And the second one I really think is quite fun. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Despite Dean's concerns about the time, we have plenty of time for questions, so. Yeah, we can't see very well up here, but. Yes. Raise your hands and wave. No questions. No questions at all. Well, I will just say that you did an admirable job following on Sir Michael Berry's admonition that we needed to tie things together of tying in previous Ersted winners as well as Ersted himself, as, as, as well as many aspects of the field. So once again, we'll thank <laughs> our get out of here. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we are not scheduled to begin um, the Homer L. Dodge Distinguished Service citations until 11. So we'll take a brief recess. We'll start back right at 11. Don't go far with the Homer L. Dodge. And I'll ask our award honorees to, to come up to the front.